ओम सदाशिव समारंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यमा अस्मराचार्य पर्यता वंदे Om. Be seated, please. Om. Good. <sighs> Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahavidyan Karava Vahai. तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मा विद्विशावहि ओम शांति 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 ओम हे एक्सक्यूज मी वेलकम बैक वेलकम आल्सो टू द मेनी स्टूडेंट्स अटेंडिंग दिस क्लासेस ऑनलाइन uh, we continue with our study of, uh, of chapter 14 of Uddhava Gita. We're actually towards the end of the chapter. And the colors are looking funny here. Do they, they look okay here? It's fine. Okay. There's something with this. Uh, <laughs> I look green. Like, <laughs> like maybe I'm not feeling well. <laughs> okay, but it looks okay there. Yeah. Good, thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> towards the end of this chapter, uh, the, uh, the chapter concludes, actually, with Uddhava having a shopping list of questions, so to speak, for Sri Krishna. Uh, I counted 36 questions, which uh, Sri Krishna goes through very methodically, and most of the questions relate to spiritual practice in our day-to-day -day lives, especially the, uh, the first portion of his list of, of questions, which we're currently seeing. The first two questions we discussed last week, just to review them, which will set the, uh, the pattern for today's uh, discussion. The first two questions were uh, about yama and niyama. Yama is usually translated as prohibitions, scripturally denied activities. And uh, uh, niyama are usually described as scripturally commanded injunctions. And these, uh, those translations make it sound very much like the commandments that we find in the Bible and other, other scriptures. But here, then just to recap this one point, the context is so com completely, oh, I'm not green anymore. That's good. <laughs> I must be feeling better. <laughs> if you're watching online, you can't see. There's a monitor right down in front of me, so I can see, what, see the PowerPoint slides and all of that. <clears throat> um, and I just distracted myself <laughs> to lose my train of thought, which isn't so hard these days. <clears throat> Okay, um, it sounds like these uh, uh, do's and don'ts found in the commandments of various religions, but that's not at all the orientation of the yamas and niyamas, but rather these are very pragmatic and practical guidelines for living a life free from conflict. You can underline that word conflict. If you want to live, but do you like living in a state of conflict? No one. We all want to live a peaceful life. No one wants to live in a state of conflict, much less a state of war, as too many people are living today. 
So how to avoid conflict in your life, Sri Krishna makes it very clear. Follow these yamas and niyamas. And he lists 12 yamas, 12 niyamas. We need not reiterate them. We saw them in the last week's class. And you know if you miss a class, you can always find the classes online. So by following these yamas and niyamas, the causes for conflict in your life are removed. And the absence of conflict has a twofold benefit. One is obviously a conflict-free life is really important for spiritual practice, for meditation in particular. But setting a spiritual practice aside, just in ordinary life, the quality of your life is vastly improved by living free from conflict. So, whereas other religions say, follow these do's and don'ts, or else, and the or else part means you will be damned to hell, here, Sri Krishna's message, and not only Sri Krishna, this was found in so many scriptures, and that is, follow these do's and don'ts for the sake of a conflict-free life. So, that we've seen in the past class, and we can now continue with the next of the uh, questions. Good. <clears throat> Shamo manishtata buddher, Shamo manishtata buddher, Dhamma indriya samyamaha, Dhamma indriya samyamaha, Titiksha dukha sammarsho, Titiksha dukha sammarsho, Jehwo pasta jayo dhritihi, Jehwo pasta jayo dhritihi. Shama is a word we generally use for quietude. And it's a value related to meditation. If you live a life where you're constantly frantic, all, always late, I don't think it's, it applies to many of you, but you know someone who's always late. Wherever they're going, they're late. And when they arrive at where they're going, do they seem very calm and relaxed? <laughs> no! <laughs> They've been rushing to get where they want uh, even though they're late. So that's the antithesis of the kind of life you really want. You want shama, quietude in your life. But here, Sri Krishna puts his own spin, so to speak. Um, he has a right to put his own spin. Just a, a comment. Sri Krishna here is teaching, th these teachings are drawn from yoga and from other scriptures. But Sri Krishna is giving this instruction to Uddhava. And instructions from Guru to Shishya are always given according to context. If the context is different, even though the teacher is the same, the teachings could be quite different. For example, suppose you and I, we were living in India uh, several hundred years ago, sitting underneath a tree and I'm giving this teaching, and chances are, my teachings would, would include a lot of emphasis on sannyasa, renouncing the world and living the life of a Hindu monk. You notice when you come here for classes, there's, that emphasis is absent because it's not appropriate in this context. If it's, it's present in all the scriptures, but the emphasis in a particular setting, the emphasis in a particular class, depends on context, depends on when these teachings are, are, are being given and to whom these teachings are being given. So here, <clears throat> Sri Krishna is giving these instructions to, um, to Uddhava, and since it's Sri Krishna himself giving these instructions, he says, he, 
he puts his own spin, so to speak, on shama, quietude. He says, shama is man nishtata buddhehe. It's a condition of your buddhi in which your buddhi has mat is the pronoun, me, nishta, being fixed. Fix your mind on me is his translation of shama, which is not a common translation at all but certainly very appropriate, and it makes a very important point, and that is, quieting your mind means what? Taking a nice nap? <laughs> no, he makes it very clear. It, our goal is not a, a quiet mind or an, uh, an empty mind, is not the goal. What should you do with the mind? Fix the mind on me, Sri Krishna says. Next, shama and dhamma always come together as a pair. Shama refers to control of the mind, and dhamma refers to control of the body. So shama controlling your mind, in this case, fixing your mind on Sri Krishna. Dhamma control of your mind, <coughs> which Sri Krishna defines as indriya samyamaha, which is a very typical translation. He doesn't put any spin on this one. He says it is samyama, control of indriya. And indriya primarily means your senses and your mind. But that makes sense because your body is directed by your five senses and your mind. You know, whatever, whatever you see, you might go after that. There's a bad American joke. You heard about the person who is on a, a seafood diet? What is a seafood diet? Seafood, eat it. <laughs> and the point of that lousy joke is that our behaviors are largely driven by our five senses and our mind. And some of you know that the mind is considered the, the sixth indriya, the one that's internal, which is why it's called antakarana, the inner sense organs. We have five pointed out, one that's inside. All six of these are to be controlled. When your mind and senses are controlled, your body will follow suit. You don't need to make additional effort to control your actions, your behavior. Next, titiksha. I've translated here as forbearance. Forbearance is a, I, I don't, typical translations include forbearance or tolerance, which I think are terrible translations because, you know, t they say you should be tolerant of other people. How does that sound if I say, I tolerate you? <laughs> that doesn't have the, the right sense. Or forbearing pain. Oh, this headache is so bad, I just have to put up with it. Oh, it hurts so much, but I have to put up with it. I'm putting up with it, but I'm complaining constantly. So, titiksha to translate it as forbearance or tolerance is not very helpful. Um, to Tiksha, Sri Krishna, he, the, the conventional kind of definition, dukkha sammarsana. Sammarsana, um, removing or better yet, putting up with dukkha, pain. Enduring pain would be a good translation here. Yeah, that's what I have here. But enduring pain with a positive attitude, certainly without complaining and tolerating you, not because I have to, <laughs> somebody is telling me, or it's politically correct, but tolerate, accepting your differences, accepting you as you are, because I want to. So positive attitude needs to be included with this tatiksha. And the last one uh, in this uh, verse, dhritihi, um, literally means holding, but in this context it would mean um, con continually holding on to something, holding on to something important, 
like holding on to a goal, which is why I've translated here as, as persistence. And, a pro and here Sri Krishna makes a very interesting definition because he recognizes in his definition that persistence often gets interrupted. Persistence here, take it as, as holding on to a goal. But goals get interrupted all the time. So you're working hard to reach a goal, and then you get hungry. <laughs> and you put down whatever you're working on, and you go and get some food. And then after going and getting some food, then you go and do something else, and you do something else, and you do something else. What happened to working on your goal? Gone. So here Sri Krishna points out two major distractions which can interrupt your efforts to be focused and remain focused on a goal. He says that there has to, you have to have the jaya, you have to overcome. You have to overcome two obstacles. One is jihwa, which literally means tongue and implies hunger and, 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 and your enjoyment of food. And the other one, very, Sri Krishna is very direct. Upastha is one of the words for genitals. So it's referring to uh, sexual desire, sexual drive. And not too surprisingly, he points out the two very human, not only human, we'll come to that, two very human drives a drive for food, a drive for sex, and it's not hard to make a connection. It's a drive for sense enjoyment. Tell me, when people eat food, are, let me say not people, let me ask you. <laughs> you're not people, <laughs> whether you're sitting here or if you're watching on your, uh, on your computer, you're not people. You're, you're, peop you're sitting here listening to this lecture. So let me ask you, when you eat food, are you eating that food to nourish your body or are you eating that food to enjoy it? That's interesting. <laughs> of course you want to nourish your body. Who doesn't want to? But when you sit down... At a night to a nice meal, are are you highly motivated to nourish your body, <laughs> or are you highly <laughs> motivated <laughs> to enjoy the nice meal? Now, this is a very obvious recognition of the fact that we are driven by pleasure, food, pleasure, sex, pleasure. Do people have sex merely to procreate? That's not generally how it works. So, sex and food are sources of pleasure, and it's often been observed that a human being who is driven by these two pleasures in particular is acting like any other animal would act. And actually, human beings are animals, right? We are uh, primates. And we are primates that belong, I think the, I don't, I, I don't remember all this, the species and uh, gen genus and all of this stuff, I don't know all of that. But I think we belong to a subcategory called Homo sapiens, okay? Sapiens doesn't mean someone driven <laughs> by searching for pleasure, food or sex. Sapiens means thinking. Human beings, what a definition. A human being is a thinking animal. An animal who thinks. An animal who thinks before acting. When a lion sees little Bambi in the clearing, <laughs> does the lion think, should, should I chase after that innocent little uh, deer and eat it or not? Should, should, should I be vegetarian today? <laughs> the lion debates. Lions don't think. 
in that human. They're instinctive. Animals are, the behavior of animals is mostly programmed. Mostly we can find some exceptions, I'm sure. But as human beings, we're blessed with these amazing minds and intellect. We can evaluate the merits and disadvantages of anything and everything we do and to fail to evaluate these merits and disadvantages, to fail to do so is to reduce ourselves to like any other animal. We become animal-like. We become like primates. Therefore, Dhriti here, Sri Krishna defines, this is a, not a common translation, but he commons it, he translates it as control over these urges for pleasure, urges that come from your tongue and from your genitals. Okay, next verse. Dandanyasa param danam, dandanyasam param danam, kama. Yeah. Kama Tyagastapa Smritam Kama Tyagastapa Smritam Swabhava Vijaya Vijaya Shauriyam Swabhava Vijaya Shauriyam Satyam Chasama Darshanam Satyam Chasama Darshanam Next Dhanam Charity What is the greatest act of charity you could give? Hey, you could give away your entire wealth you know, to, to some worthy organization. Some people do this in their wills. That's wonderful. Uh, of course, it's at the end of their life, they could be giving it throughout their lives, but still wonderful to, to give away your entire wealth to charity. But Sri Krishna points out here, there is something that you can give that's more valuable than this kind of material or charitable support. And he says what you can give is, he says that param dhanam, the highest thing you can give, the most valuable thing you can give is danda nyasam, nyasaha. Nyasa giving up, giving up danda. Danda literally means stick, has to do with punishment. Not that you're going to punish someone with a stick. I bet you've punished people with your tongue, right? Or with an email. <laughs> yeah. Those fiery emails you send off. Oh, this will really get them. And you write, <laughs> hey, those are efforts, Put it, call it what it is, those are deliberate efforts to cause injury to another person. Maybe not physical injury, but you're trying to hurt them. When you do that, what do they call it? Tongue lashing. When, some, when somebody does something you're extremely un, unhappy with, you give them a good tongue lashing, they say in American English means what? You're using your words to hurt that person, put them in their place, so to speak. Or when you write that fiery email. You, you call it blowing off steam. Sri Krishna calls it an intent to hurt someone else. To call it blowing off steam is a euphemism. It covers up the truth. And then the truth is, is that your fiery email will upset someone. It will cause emotional harm. So, according to Sri Krishna, the best thing you can give someone, he calls it danda nyasam, and we, it's common to supply another word here, which is simply abhayam, fearlessness. This is one of the two vows that all sannyasis take, Main vow, of course, is sannyasa, renouncing the worldly activities. But the second main vow is abhayam. Abhayam sarva bhutebhyaha, 
Fearlessness is given unto all living beings. Do no harm. Interesting. Don't medical doctors use a, a similar expression that, uh, I forget the Greek, who, who is it, not Socrates? Any, anyway, doctors are committed to not causing harm in any way whatsoever. Th there we go. Thank you. Hippocritic oath. Hippocrates was the Greek doctor. So a hypocritic, hypocritic or hypocritic? Well, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> Give me some Sanskrit I can understand. Anyway. The, po the point is, is that doctors understand that they can cause harm. And so they make this vow not to cause harm. The greatest thing you can give other living beings is not by bringing out your checkbook, but rather this vow not to cause harm. Sri Krishna calls danda nyasam, renouncing aggression. That's a nice translation. Then, kama tyagaha. So first we had danda nyasa, now we have kama tyaga. So he's talking now about tapas, the next quality. So the, the question we could ask is, what is the best form of tapas? Is if somebody says, yeah, I fast once or twice a month. If fasting once or twice a month, if fasting once a month is good, Fasting twice a month is twice as good? Four times a month? Thirty times a month? <laughs> it gets a little silly, right? So let's keep in mind, <laughs> what is the purpose of these spiritual practices? The purpose of tapas is not merely to, you know, in, in the case of upavasa, in the case of fasting, it's not merely to withdraw from food. So Sri Krishna gives a very good, good explanation. He, he says that the highest form of tapas is kama tyaga. It is the tyaga, the giving up of kama desire. Giving up desire. And this, he, he is... He's stuck here, not he, Krishna, but he, Vyasa, the author of our, of our text, is stuck here with the limitations of meter, so he, he speaks very briefly here. And the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is, if you take this literally, renunciation of desire is tapas. So suppose your desire is Tea. Everyone likes this chai. Ma ma masala chai. Everyone. <laughs> lots, lots of sugar and milk and some other spices. Yes, elichi and all of this. Elichai. Um, point here is suppose your tapas is going to be you're not going to drink tea. Any tea. Okay? You, you've heard me give this example before. So you stop drinking tea. The next morning you get up. Have you given up your desire for tea? Not at all. <laughs> you want it more than ever. And the point I'm making is you can't give up desire. What you, and it, that's exactly what it says here, Kama Tiaga. But it says so because we don't have enough room to put in more words. It's being given very tersely. You cannot give up desire. You can give up being driven by desire. You cannot, as an act of will, give up desire, as the T example shows. But you can use your free will to avoid acting on those desires. That is tapas, to avoid acting on desires and to instead act according to dharma, that is tapas. A kind of tapas that is infused in your whole life. Um, as we go along, we're going to see that all of these practices are 
meant? You know, so often we think of spiritual practice as something we do. You, you sit down in front of an altar and you do your sadhana. You go to a temple and you say some prayers. So we think of spiritual practice, sadhana, as something very specific and concrete. But in our discussion here, the practices are a matter of shifting your lifestyle. Yama niyama, following these injunctions and prohibitions, it's a matter of changing your entire lifestyle, living a spiritual life. Similarly, shama, dhamma, tatiksha, we saw in a prior verse. These are all not specific activities that you do, but they're ways in which you transform your life. You transform your life in such a way that it becomes suitable and more conducive for spiritual growth culminating in moksha. We'll come back to that point. <coughs> so tapas. So tapas then is not something you do once a month or twice a month. Tapas is something you should be doing every day. And that is not being compelled by your desires, according to Sri Krishna. Next is shauryam, um, courage, strength, valor. And oftentimes uh, we use that word in, I must be used a lot in the uh, Mahabharata, where it talks <laughs> about all the great warriors and they have this shauryam. But here, Sri Krishna says that the highest expression of shauryam is not conquering an enemy on a battlefield. He says the highest expression of shauryam is vijaya, conquering what? The number one enemy who is not on the battlefield. The number one enemy is sitting in your chair. <laughs> right? We so often inadvertently become our own worst enemies. When we fail to follow dharma, when we do something that we know we shouldn't be doing, when we make terrible mistakes in life, we become our own worst enemy. That's the number one enemy to be conquered, and that's real strength and courage, according to Sri Krishna. Last one he gives here is Sat. Yam, truth, reality, uh, samadarshanam. Um, nice definition. So often words like satyam are given a very abstract, conceptual uh, meaning. So satyam, jnanam, anantam, brahma, it says in Upanishad, brahman is satyam, absolute reality, jnanam, consciousness, anantam, without limit boundaryless, and it becomes very abstract, theoretical. Sri Krishna, again, puts his own spin, as it were, on this word. It does mean all of that, but the emphasis given here by Sri Krishna, samadarshanam. So that reality is equally present in every single person. Samadarshana means looking upon all the same. And not just looking upon them as the same, but treating them. <laughs> if you look upon them the same and then treat them differently, that's uh, hypocritical. So, to look upon and treat all people as manifestations of divinity. What a huge practice. Suppose you you, you take this very seriously, and you should. Take it home. Take it home in your heart. And this is a spiritual practice that you can immediately put all of every one of these. You can put them into your day-to-day -day life. And starting now, start treating people with respect and courtesy because everyone deserves courtesy and respect. And allow me to put in a little editorial comment. 
even if they belong to the opposite political party, <laughs> they, <laughs> they deserve <clears throat> your respect and love and courtesy, even, <clears throat> even if they follow another religion. They deserve your respect, courtesy, no matter who they are, no matter what is the situation. Huh. You can really extend this. And, and that'll, that'll be the end of the class. I think, I think we won't. So another important spiritual practice you can employ now in your daily life. Then, next verse. <clears throat> Ritam chasu nritavani, Ritam chasu nritavani, Kavi bi parikirtita, Kavi bi parikirtita, Karma swasangama shaucham, Karma swasangama shaucham, Tiaga sanyasa huchyate. Tyaga sannyasa huchyate. Ritam is connected to satyam. Just like shama and dhamma come as a pair, these two, satyam and ritam come as a pair. They can mean exactly the same thing. But here again, Sri Krishna puts his own observation. I, I call it spin. Maybe that's not the... In American English, that putting a spin on something has a very negative connotation, so maybe I shouldn't uh, put it in that way. Sri Krishna adds his own emphasis. So if we think of, of ritam as a synonym for satyam, and take satyam in the sense of speaking truth, which is our context here. He says that ritam, speaking truth, is certainly vani, speech, but it is speech that is sunrita. Very nice word. Sunrita has a, has a variety of meanings which want to convey... I don't know, it's like there's a word that doesn't exist and you give a bunch of other words to suggest the word that doesn't exist. Some translations of sunrata would, would include your speech should be sunrata, pleasant, gentle. And sunrata, it should be good, it should be helpful, it should be beneficial. This is very, his word sunrata here connects to a very common teaching that whatever you say should meet three criteria. It should satyam, uh, priyam, and hitam. Whatever you say should not only be true, it should be pleasant, which means free from harsh edges and barbs. And finally, it should be hitam, it should be beneficial. So all of that is suggested by the word sunritam. Just speaking truth doesn't make you dharmic, right? Because truth can be said in very harsh ways, and truth can be said even in harmful ways. What is gossip? <laughs> What's being gossip could be absolutely true, but that gossip is harmful. Okay. And this is the kind of speech which is kavi bihi, by the wise, here kavi doesn't mean poet, it means a wise person, who, and uh, this value is parikirtita, it is declared, it is uttered by the wise. Words which are, words which are not only true, but they're pleasant and they're useful. Um, words which are uttered by the wise. You might wonder, why does he include this uttered by the wise? Not mechanically, um, I, not much of an issue, I think, for any of you, but some people fall into this, this idea of imitating someone. Someone who's great, they then imitate the person. So if the person is a person always speaks truth, then they imitate that person by always speaking truth. Well, all, imitating someone is being like a parrot, and there was a hilarious story 
of Shankaracharya having a very intense debate, you know, in uh, maybe outside under a tree, and there's a parrot in this tree. And they, they go on talking, talking, and this parrot is listening intently and picking up this stuff. After the debate's over, the, the parrot goes on chirping, Swata Pramanam, Swata Pramanam, which is a very complex technical term. Swata Pramanam, I won't bore you with the details. This parrot apparently picked it up. It didn't pick up the the deep philosophical idea, just the sound, sound bite. So here, by pointing to the, these are the words of the wise, imitation like the parrot doesn't work. It has to come from the heart, not imitating someone. Then next comes Shaocham, purity. Many kinds of purity, and here Sri Krishna talks about a specific kind of purity. He says, karmasu asangamaha. Asangamaha, uh, detachment. Attach, uh, detachment, sorry, asangamaha. Detachment from what? Karmasu, actions. And in particular, actions done for the sake of fulfilling desires. That's the context. So, usually, desires compel action. We've in many other classes, especially in our prior classes on Bhagavad Gita, we've spoken extensively how ordinary behavior is driven by raga and dvesha. Raga and dvesha, these, these, these inner compulsions to chase after what you want, to run away from what you don't want, that generally compels people's actions, and Sri Krishna says, what is real purity here, shaucham, is to overcome those inner compulsions. That's purity, because where does impurity come from? By chasing after what you want and running away from what you don't want. This is why he puts his own emphasis on Shaucham. Last one here, Tiagaha. He gives a very typical uh, uh, translation, Sanyasaha. And as I said before, emphasis always depends on context. Here he is teaching his cousin, uh, Uddhava. Sri Krishna is teaching Uddhava. I think Uddhava has a family. So notice Sri Krishna just touches upon this. He doesn't go into a long discussion about why sannyasa is the most important spiritual practice. Again, context counts. So he says the highest form of tyaga, of giving up, is sannyasa as a lifestyle, but he doesn't say it's the right thing for Uddhava. Okay, then couple more, and then we'll wrap up for today. Then, next, yes. Dharma hishtam dhanam nrnam Dharma hishtam nrnam Yajnoham bhagavatamaha Yajnoham bhagavatamaha Dakshina jnana sandeshaha Dakshina jnana sandeshaha Pranayama parambalam, pranayama parambhanam. Next, dhanam, wealth. What is the highest form of wealth? Just to help us understand, we can just go through and see what Sri Krishna says. Better to approach it in which we understand why does Sri Krishna give this particular definition of dhanam. Dhanam, wealth, what is the value of wealth? If you have millions of dollars in stock and the stock market is really down <laughs> and you don't want to sell any of that stock, how does that stock make you wealthy? You can't touch it. You have to wait for the market to correct. So the value of wealth is not having 
pieces of paper. Yeah, okay, nowadays it's not even piece. Who has pieces of paper? Nowadays it's all numbers and, and computers, fine, which is fine. But the point here is the value of wealth is its ability to make you content in the future, right? The value of wealth is future contentment. Think about that. Future, so it gives you security now, but more importantly, it gives you contentment in the future when you spend it. If you have lots of wealth, my guru liked to make this observation, if you have lots of wealth and never spend it, what good is it? It was one of his fundraising lines. <laughs> <laughs> he says, money, money is like water. If it just sits there, it gets stagnant and stinks. <laughs> he had all this, all his good fundraising things. <clears throat> so, wealth benefits you at some point in the future when you spend it. Of course, Sri Krishna is not talking about material wealth here. What does he talk about wealth? He says that the, the the ishtam dhanam, the most desirable wealth, nrnam, for people. The most desirable wealth for people is dharma. And here, dharma has a specific meaning. It means accumulating good karma. It has other meanings in other contexts. Here it means the accumulation of good karma. Tell me, an accumulation of good karma is a little bit like money and the bank, right? It will bring for you future uh, desirable things, future contentment, let us say. The money in the bank may or may not bring you future contentment. You may have to spend it on a crisis, an emergency situation, but dharma, understood as an accumulation of good karma, will absolutely bless you at some point in the future. So that is the highest form of wealth, according to Sri Krishna. Then we can say, what is the most sacred of all things? What is most sacred? And generally, especially in ancient times, you, the image would come of a, of a number of priests gathered around a yajnakund, Homokun, making offerings into a sacrificial fire, chanting all these Vedic mantras. That's a common image of what is most sacred, what is most holy. Sri Krishna says, I don't think so. <laughs> he puts it in very personal terms. He says, what, what is Bhagavat, Bhag, huh? yes. Bhagavat Tamaha, what is most blessed, what is most sacred, sacred is aham. <laughs> Sri Krishna can say, I am that which is most sacred, far more sacred than these rituals. Interesting, throughout the Bhagavad Gita, and here again in the Uddhava Gita, Sri Krishna continues to criticize excessive rituality, rituals the excessive focus on rituals. And I find it amusing that modern Hindus will often say there's too much emphasis on, on ritual. Well, thousands of years ago, Sri Krishna made the same observation, too much emphasis on ritual. So this is a, a thread that continues throughout this tradition. It's very easy to get caught up with all this ritualism, but it's crucial not to place too much emphasis on it as Sri Krishna uh, criticizes it here. Next, Dakshina. Again, words depend on context. Here, Dakshina means um, a gift given to a teacher after your studies are complete. So it has other meanings in other contexts. Here, a gift given to a teacher at the end of studies. And what is, what kind of gift does the teacher want? You know, this is a common question. What, what, sometimes people 
um, they want to give me a, a gift. So what, what, can you, what can you give a sannyasi anyway? You know, at maximum, you give some uh, bhiksha, some food. Beyond that, there's not much. Let me just make a bad joke. Suppose your gift is a hairbrush. <laughs> not terribly, <laughs> you, and at least not these days, not, not terribly useful. So if you're going to give a gift, it should be something the, the guru has value for. And so here, um, the gift that should be given to the guru, Sri Krishna says, is jnana sandeshaha. Sandesha, again, can have many meanings. Here, sandesha is, is take it as, as a message. A message whose content is jnanam, spiritual wisdom. That message is the most valuable thing. And what does it mean that that message is a gift given to the guru? In two primary ways. One is, you should have received that message. And second is, you should be prepared to share that message with others. So the message, you should have the message, which means the teachings should have gone in to assimilate these teachings. And to assimilate these teachings means, I, you know so well, not just to understand them conceptually, but to allow these teachings to shift the way you see yourself, the way you see your life, to shift your worldview. Gradually, your worldview is, undergoes change as a result of these teachings. And when your worldview has undergone change, then that rubs off on others. You don't even have to, to say anything. Just by being an example. And I bet this has happened to, to some of you at least. Those of you who have been on a spiritual path for a long time, many of you have maybe become a little less edgy, a little less angular, little less quick to be angry or frustrated. And chances are, some of the people in your family or your friends have noticed that. Not surprising. And if they haven't noticed it, that's because they're not noticing things. Some, some people just don't get it. They don't notice anything. That's okay. But... <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. People are like that, we have to understand. If they don't notice, they don't. It's like someone who dresses up so nicely and no one notices. <laughs> what can you do for that? So they don't notice. <laughs> but those people who do notice that you have changed, you become, to some extent, a role model for them. They see how sadhana has changed you, for the better, obviously. <laughs> and having seen that demonstrated in your behavior, then they're more likely to see the value of it in their own lives. So this is, this is the best gift you can give a teacher, is to embody those teachings. Last one Sri Krishna gives here is balam, strength. And the, what is the highest form, parambaram, balam? What is the highest form of strength? According to Sri Krishna, it's not fighting on the battlefield, but fighting, fighting is not the right term. Um, controlling your mind. Not controlling the enemies on the battlefield, controlling your mind. And one of the best ways to control your mind as a stage of preparation for meditation is pranayama. Breathing exercises, controlling the breath helps to control your mind. Let's see just one more verse, and then we'll conclude. Bhago ma bhago ma aishwaro bhavo bhago ma aishwaro bhavo labho mad bhakti ruttamaha Babho mad bhakti ruttamaha vidyatmani bhidabha 
बाधो विद्यात्मनेबाधो जुगुप्सा ह्रियरखर्मसु जुगुप्सा ह्रियरखर्मसु भगा ब्लसिंग्स वट इज मोस्ट ब्लसड श्री कृष्ण टॉकिंग श्री कृष्ण हिमसेल्फ इज स्पीकिंग सज म इज मे माइन मे ऐश्वर भाव मै डिवाइन नेचर मै डिवाइन ग्लोरीज मै नेचर सीयिंग द कॉन्टेक्स सीयिंग मै ग्लोरीज is the most blessed as arjuna was blessed to have on the battlefield that vishwarupa darshana so seeing the glories of shri krishna is the greatest blessing bhaga here means blessing what is the best labha the best gain the best attainment in life not surprisingly shri krishna continues in the same vein he says mad bhakti hi uttama labha uttama labha the the highest attainment is the attainment of mad bhakti devotion unto me highest attainment notice he doesn't say moksha he says devotion unto me and of course the two are connected once the devotion to shri krishna comes everything else follows that's the starting point the most important point is the starting point just a quick quick uh, observation about spiritual life the most important step was already taken if you're waiting for something to happen it's already happened <laughs> and that is you have recognized the value of spiritual growth and spiritual practice and that important step has already happened or you wouldn't be sitting here today so that's all part of it that leads then to the uttama labha the highest gain is devotion to shri krishna and then the path just continues next one very interesting observation shri krishna says what is the highest vidya highest kind of knowledge he says atmani bhida badha it is the badha the negation of bhida differences atmani with regard to it's it's singular in number i'm just struggling with with some grammar the reference is to recognizing the truth present in me that so called inner divinity shri krishna calls here atma that inner divinity in me is identical to the inner divinity in you in every single person here in every single person in every single place around the world to erase that division amongst people that division <clears throat> that division is such a huge problem the moment someone is different it becomes acceptable to allow them to be hurt <coughs> huge topic we're at the very end of the class not the right time for this but a thought to think about when you go home when when there's a division between people yeah sorry um and i'm a little emotional about this because every morning i get my news on on uh, internet so i go i get some news and every morning and this is i don't want to get into politics but the first thing i see every morning is more palestinians being killed and it just hurts 
You know, see that again? And there are a thousand reasons that this war has gone on for so long, and I don't want to get into who did this, who did that, who's to blame, whatever. It's complicated. One thing that's not complicated is that Palestinian civilians, women, children are dying every day. That part is not complicated. And that is due to this dividing people up into groups. If there wasn't this division between Jews and Palestinians or Jews and Arabs, if that division weren't there, this war would not have taken place. Anyway, uh, last one here. Jagup Sahrihi. What is the best? Hrihi here means modesty. What is the best, the most important kind of modesty? Modesty in the sense of when you like shrink back it has, it has many meanings, but if you take of modesty as like a shrinking back from something, uh, something that usually we shrink back. <laughs> Why do you shrink back? That, that's complicated. We'll leave that aside. But here he's talking about a shrinking back because of jugupsa is a dis, disgust, as the meaning of the word. Uh, akarmasu, karma means a dharmic action. Akarma here means an adharmic action. So here, the best form of modesty is to be repelled or revulsed by adharmic action, to shrink back from these adharmic actions. Okay, just to conclude our, our discussion for today, a n number of very important values have been given in these verses. Spiritual values, values which are not meant to just understand, they're meant to be put into your lives. You know, to merely understand that that you know, Patanjali gives five yamas and niyamas, Sri Krishna gives twelve yamas and niyamas. Who cares? <laughs> Honestly, who cares? The point is, is that all of these teachings are meant to be integrated into our lives. It's a matter of changing your lifestyle. That's crucial. And I'll, I'll make a, a, a common example. Doctors all say the same thing about weight loss. To change your weight, you have to change not your diet, not your exercise. They say you have to change your lifestyle, which includes <laughs> diet and exercise and other things as well. It's a shift of lifestyle. So the final point here is if you want to make significant progress in a life of spiritual growth, you don't have to do A, B, or C. That's too easy. What you have to do, change your entire lifestyle. For most of you, you're already on, you're already halfway there. Okay, keep going. <laughs> you're halfway, that's great. You've lost half the weight you need to lose. Great, keep going. You've incorporated many of these values into your lives. You're halfway. So, keep, keep going. Okay, uh, quick announcements. Uh, tomorrow, Sunday, we have our Vedanta class. Uh, Shankara's great Upadesha Sahasri uh, text, 10 o'clock, followed by Satsang at 11 o'clock. Today, immediately after class, we have a gardening project uh, to do. Invite you, we invite all of you, if you'd like to go and, and help with this gardening project, please do. And I think Hina has arranged some lunch for you, little additional encouragement. So if you can, please stay back help with the gardening project. Uh, I'm not sure where you're meeting, but you'll meet in the lobby. And then um, and enjoy lunch afterwards. We'll conclude with their prayers.
ಓಂ ಘನಾನಾ ಗಣಪತಿ ಗಮ್ಮವಾಮಹೆ ಕವಿಂಗವೀನಾಪಮಶ್ರವಸ್ತಮ ಜ್ಯೇಷ್ಠರಾಜ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನಸ್ಪತಹನಶ್ರನ್ವನ್ ಊತಿಭ್ಯಸ್ಸಿರಸಾರಣ ಮಹಾಗಣಪತ ನಮಃ ಈಶ್ವರೋ ಗುರುರಾತ್ಮೇಥಿ ಮೂರ್ತಿಭೈರವಿಭಾಗಿನೆ ವ್ಯೋಮವ್ಯಾಪ್ತೇಹಾಯ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ವಸುದೇವಸುತ ಖಂಸಚಾನೂರಮರ್ದನ ಿ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಓಂ ಸರ್ವೇ ಸುಖಿನೇ ಸಂತು ನಿರಾಮೇ ಭದ್ರಿ ಪಶ್ಯಂತು ಮಾ ಕಶ್ಚಿದ್ದುಖಭಾಗ್ಭವೇತ್ ಅಸಥೋ ಮಾ ಸತ್ಕಮಯ ಥಮಸೋ ಮಾ ಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೋರ್ ಮಾ ಅಮೃತಂಗಮಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್